are watching Faith World TV. Faith World TV, changing the world with the Word of God. God bless you and thank you for tuning in once again. And thank you for those who have been following us in these studies on the book of Hebrews. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome to our Heroes Hall of Fame series, um, which is um, taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, which is the most action-packed chapter of the Bible. At uh, the moment, we're at verse 32 to 34, and we're looking at the life of Gideon. And under the life of Gideon, we're looking at what qualifies, who qualifies uh, for the call of God, who qualifies for the call of God. And um, today's title is called Never Despise the Small Happiness in Your Life. I, mean, I decide to give this title in order to challenge and encourage us. Never despise the small happiness in your life or ministry. And why is this? Because we live in a celebrated culture uh, where many desire to be rich, to be famous, uh, to be recognized, to be admired. People are, you know, are, are looking for the American dream. People seek worship. And sadly, this celebratory culture has invaded the church as well uh, because there are those within the church who seek recognition. They want to be that famous prophet, the famous pastor, preacher, uh, singer or miracle worker. But the fruit of those who possess the spirit of Christ is humility, you know, which is contrary to the spirit uh, behind the celebrity culture, because our God is humble. And, and he says those who seek to exalt, him, ex exalt himself will be humble. And again, you know, God said in the book of Jeremiah, um, 45 verse 5 he said are you seeking great things for yourself don't do it humility is one of the important qualities we've been looking at uh, in terms of those who qualify um, for the call of God let's just have a quick um, uh, refresher on what we've been doing so far so in the first and second part of this message is we've been looking at the five qualities that God looks for in a person to be used by him. One, that person has to be humble. You have to have a designing spirit to tell between error and truth. You have to be faithful in little things and be able to stand alone in the face of persecution and problems. And also you need to be courageous. So we're going to look at one uh, quality today, which is God uses people who understand the principle of smallness. And this is where my title comes from from today. Never despise your small beginning. Never despise the small happenings in your life or ministry. Now, God um, was teaching Gideon the principle of smallness. Why? Because in Judges chapter 7, 1 to 7, the Bible tells us that God told Gideon to reduce his army personnel. You know, Gideon raised an army of 32,000. And then God told him, I read verse 2, he says, The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own. So in the end, Gideon reduced his army of 32,000 to 300. Now, this does not make sense to the natural mind. This does not, this is not make sense to the, to the natural mind because you are going into battle, you know, uh, with, 30, with 300 men against almost half a million. You know, the Bible gives us a rough picture of, uh, of uh, the number of, of the forces that Gideon was fighting against. In Judges chapter 7, verse 12, we read, The armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of East had set in the valley like a swarm of locusts. Their camels were like grains of sand on the seashore, too many to count. Now, this is quite difficult for Gideon to grasp. Am I going to go into battle with, with 300 men against half a million soldiers? God was trying to teach Gideon not to focus on himself or people or human resources or, or other things because those things might fail, but God will never fail us. That's the kind of biblical example of someone who trusted in human personnel, in power, in human strength. And his name was Saul. In 1 Samuel 13, verse 8 to 13, God gave 
um, King Saul. King Saul is the first king of Israel. He gave him an assignment, gave him uh, some instructions to uh, obey, but he failed to. And why? In um, verse 11 of First Samuel 13, God sent the prophet Simon to rebuke Saul. And, 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 and Simon said, what is this you have done, Saul? Saul said, I saw my men scattering for me, and you didn't arrive within the time. And the Philistines, my enemies, were ready to march against us. So, and I haven't sought help from God. So I felt compelled to offer the bond offering myself before you came. Now, Saul did something he was not allowed to do. It was only the priest that was allowed to make sacrifices. But he did that which he was not commanded to do. And Samuel said, the prophet, you have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel. You see, King Saul did not believe in the principle of smallness, that little things are big if God is in it. He focused on himself. He focused on human resources. He was focused, focusing on the number of his army. And because they decided him, you know, he crumbled and failed. failed. And let's look at a, another good example of someone who trusted in the Lord. And his name was King David. Now, King, that was the, when King David had this fight with Goliath. Now, the Bible tells us that the people of Israel fled from Goliath because it was so huge, no one could fight him, so they fled. But this man, this young man, David, went on his own without an army, without weapons. And we read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and, and David was saying to this man, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And the Spirit of God led him to say these words in verse 47. He says, And everyone assembled here, we know the Lord rescues his people, not with sword or spear. This is the Lord's battle he will give to. And that's the key to understand that battle belongs to the Lord. And what's the lesson for us? You see, the person God uses does not rely on human numbers or human wisdom or power. They did not accept defeat because they don't have human or material resources or they're all on their own or because they don't have powerful connections they trust in the power and the goodness of god their confidence is the lord and that's why the bible tells us in jeremiah 17 verse 5 that cursed are those who put their trust in mere human who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the lord they are like straws in the desert, you know, uh, in a barren wilderness. They wither. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord, who has made their Lord, who, who has made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like, like trees planted along the river, but whose roots reach deep into the river. And they stay green. They are not bothered by heat or drought. You see, that's what happens when we trust in the Lord, it, when our hope is in the Lord, when our confidence is in the Lord. You see, we are not moved by drought. We are not moved by economic crises or famine because there's no famine in the kingdom of God. There's no economic crisis in heaven. There's always abundance because the Bible says it's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places through Christ Jesus. Now, why is this truth, this principle of smallness that, you know, little is big? If God is in it, why is this truth so powerful? Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth will search you. It's because there are just of us who think because we're all alone, we have no strength or little strength, we have no human or material resources or connections. You know, we are already defeated, we are, we are worthless. We believe that the lie of the devil, that you know, God has abandoned us. You know, we have no one, we have no one to call. For example, there are those who think, Oh, Think, think in this way. If only I had my parents, if only I had my mom and dad. But you see, we live in a broken world. And there will be those who will, live, who will lose their, their mom at, at, at the time of birth or uh, through um, accident or through divorce or separation or, or, or death. You know, these things happen. And that's why we have the encouragement from the Lord, from the Psalm, we, Psalm 27, and we say, you know, though my father or mother forsake me, you know, the Lord has my back. The Lord will take care of me. So there are those who think only if I 
had a spouse to help me to stand with me. If only I had friends or I know people in high places, uh, then if only I had enough money, then, you know, I wouldn't be in this disadvantaged position or situation. I won't be in this, this situation. I, I, I will have achieved great things. I will have achieved my dream. I will have been able to do this or that. If only I had this, if only I had that, if only I knew that person, if only my brother, you know, was the high commissioner, was a senator, a minister. But God is saying, you know, that kind of thinking, that kind of mindset is wrong. It will not bring you his blessing. It will not bring you, you know, his, his blessing, his goodness, his favor. A good example we can learn from which the Bible is giving us is that it's the life of Joseph. Okay, remember God is trying to, to teach us the principle of smallness. That even if you are small, if you, are, if you have little or no strength or no human or financial resources or human connection, as long as you understand that God is with you, nothing can stop you, nothing can defeat you. And that's the miracle of Christmas, you know, that you know, in, in, his name will be called Jesus Christ. He will save us from our sins. His name will be called Emmanuel, God with us, God in us. And with God, nothing shall be impossible. So let's go back to this biblical example of Joseph. Joseph was brought up in a wealthy home. But suddenly, as we live in a broken world, things can happen. Things can change. Joseph's life changed in a moment. A young teenager, he was kidnapped and sold as a slave into Egypt. Where, you know, he did not understand their language. He had to learn their language, their customs and traditions. He had, no, he had no parental support or care or love there. He had no family to, to, to call upon, an auntie, an uncle. He had no one. He had no friends in high places. You know, there was no... Um, a slave had no rights, so um, there is no pet, no union he could go to 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 appeal for discrimination. You know, he was, he was like on his own, but yet not on his own. He believed in God, and the Bible says the presence of God was with Joseph. And I want to encourage you today. You might feel alone. You might feel you have no one. I have no brother, no sister in this place where I am. You know, you might be in a situation whereby there's no one you can call to, no relation. You have no connection, no friends in high places. So you're just like Joseph, but you have God with you. If you're a believer, you have God. If you don't, then you need to receive Christ before the end of this message, okay? That if God be with you, who can be against you? You have all that you need. Now, let's look at another lesson for leaders from uh, a bishop, pastor, apostle, you know, to, to a, a, a spouse or siblings, because we're all leaders in a, in a, in a sense, because leaders influence people. Uh, what's that lesson? Lead to is great if God is in it. Okay, let's go back to that scriptural reference in, in Judges chapter 7, verse 1 to 3. God told um, Gideon, you know, to reduce his congregation, let's put it that way, of 32,000 army, yeah, to 300 people. This made him feel discouraged and defeated. But he still trusted in the word of God because he's, he was learning the principle of smallness. He was resting the fact that if God, you know, if God, if God is in it, little smallness is still big. And because he obeyed God, God used his throne army to deliver millions of people, to deliver the people of Israel. Because today there are so many ministries or churches or ministers today focusing on numbers instead of righteousness, justice, love, mercy, you know, devotion to God. To, to, to some, a large number of people in their congregation is a source of pride and achievement. And to some with fewer people in their congregation feel discouraged, feel their face. So they're under, you know, pressure. There are many ministers, they're under pressure to build their congregation, you know, with whatever means possible. But we have to understand that God is the builder of his church. He said, God said in Matthew um, 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And again in Acts 2, 47, he says, the Lord has to his, has his church daily those who are being saved. Let's take a biblical example. For example, Elijah, God calls him to, to minister to 
hundreds of his people, like when he was on Mount Carmel, he ministered maybe thousands of people. And then the, God removed him from that position and posted him to a village. In 1 Kings 17, verse 89, we read that God posted Elijah to a village of Zarephath to minister to a widow and her son in the city of Sidon. Or like Gideon, God gave him, you know, reduced its, uh, its congregation to 300. I said, Gideon, this is who, who, these are the people, people I am giving you, and, you, and through the Spirit, you are going to sh shake the world. Now, Gideon could have gone to a conference, how to grow your church in, in a year. That would have helped Gideon. But yes, these conferences are good if they are biblical and balanced. And, and we'll go look at the example of Jesus Christ himself. Sometimes he ministers to, Jesus ministers to thousands, he sometimes ministers to 70, to 12, and sometimes just to one person. Like, for example, in John chapter 4, 27 to 29, where he, uh, he ministered to a, a woman of Samaria, the Samaritan woman, was just one lady. But, you know, Jesus imparted that woman, and that woman imparted her village uh, that they all had an encounter with Christ. Okay? Just because the ministry is small does not mean God is not in it. You see, God may call you to minister to few people or pastor a small church or teach um, a, 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 a children or adults, teaching our children or adults on the school or lead a small group or God might even push to a village. I know this is a problem for many, especially when they graduate from seminary. You know, everybody wants to be posted to the city. No one wants to go to the village because in the village, you know, you lack amenities like maybe light or Wi-Fi or, you know, you'd be lucky if you get a bike. You know, but in the city, you know, they put you in a nice house, you know, uh, give you a nice car, give you gifts, pay you a good salary. So no one wants to go to the village. But, uh, 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 you know, moving on from that, you see, God could, start, could call you to serve in a village or minister in prisons or even pastor your own family. For example, uh, a biblical example, Amran and Jochebed. Now, mentioning that name, most of you might not know Amran Jokobet, but if you turn with me to Numbers 26, or you just follow me, Numbers 26, 59, you know who Amran and Jokobet is. He said, Amran and Jokobet became the parents of Aaron, Moses, and their sister Miriam. You see, this parent brought up three children that impacted the, the whole nation. They were leaders in the nations of Israel. And God might be calling you to do the same, just to pass your own family. In 1 Corinthians 12, 5, 7, I want you just to, this will help us to understand that, you know, 5 to 7, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, okay? God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. It's the same Jesus who teaches in Sunday school, adult Sunday school, um, children's Sunday school, who is the same Jesus teaching in prisons because, you know, it's, it's, it, the Bible says it's no longer I that live or Christ that lives in me. We have Christ in us and Christ is the same Christ minister in the village, minister in the city, minister in a large auditorium. It's the same Christ, same God doing the same thing. Another good example I want to use is um, uh, the, the, the founders of the Methodist Church, Charles and John Wesley. Their parents were humble um, 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 parents. Um, Susanna and um, Samuel, they had 19 children. None of the children died. Four of them were twins. And even the wife, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, you know, you know, expressed many hardships as a woman on her own because her husband left her for, um, for over a year. And maybe today you're a single parent. You see, God is with you as well with Susanna. And this is a testimony that I read of Susanna in Wikipedia. Uh, 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 quote, it said, although she never preached a sermon or published a book or founded a church, she is known as the mother of Methodism. Why? Because two of her sons, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, as children consciously and unconsciously apply the example and teachings and circumstances of their home life. She impacted their children. You see, today many of us, we, we want to, we are seeking great things. The ministers are going here and there. And the, where, their, and where, where their homes are suffering, their wives are suffering, the enemy has wrought havoc in their homes because they are seeking great things. They are not being where God wants them to be. So another lesson is, you know, from this is that we should not take pride in numbers. 
we should be careful not to take both, but rather in the Lord because numbers can be the same. What do I mean? You see, again, we go back to our scriptural reference, George, George, book of Judges chapter 7. You know, God told Gideon to, re to reduce the number in his congregation. Not only that, God saw in, in, the, in his congregation of 32,000 that only 300 people were right with him. Okay, that's why we need to be humble and never boast about our numbers in our congregation. Because what is 300 out of 32,000? That is almost 1%. Only 1% in Gideon's congregation was right. I had the right hand with God. That's why the Bible says, do not boast in chariots and your horses. Do not boast in, you know, um, um, in, um, in your power or your numbers, but rather boast in the Lord. You know, Paul put it in this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. He says, for what gives you the right to make such a judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given you? If everything you have is from God, why boast as if it were not a gift? Everything we have is from God. Whether God calls you to pastor two people or five or hundred, five hundred, ten thousand, it's all from God. We should never, you know, feel despised. You know, in Zechariah 4 10 said, despise not the small beginnings, despise not the small happenings. Okay, this was said a lot of people free, ministers free. You see, why should we know about because we may have fifty thousand in our congregation only one percent and what is one percent of fifty thousand five hundred or you may have five hundred only one percent what is uh, sorry you may have five thousand your congregation and only one percent is right or uh, has a right hand with god and what's one percent of five thousand only fifty or even you may have five hundred only one percent five is right with god and in some cases you may have fifty you may have five you may have 5,000, you may have 100,000, and 0% is not right with God. You may say, how can this happen? You mean, that is true. You remember, Jesus said that many will say my name, uh, Lord, we cast out demons, we prophesy, we did miracles. And again, there were two churches in the book of Revelations. In, in, in Revelation chapter 3, you know, the church of Sardis. You know, if you, you can, uh, you can look, at, look, at, look at it, um, you can write it at Revelation 3. One, three. You know, Jesus said to that church, he said, you have this reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You know, you, you, know, church, you know, we might have that reputation of being alive in the sense of, oh, you know, we're a trendy short church, fashionable church, you know, fantastic praise worship, uh, and you know, everybody's high. But Jesus said, you are dead. And also you have the lukewarm church as well, you know, the Laodicean church. They thought, well, I'm rich, I have need of nothing, we are cool, you know, we are blessed and highly favored. But Jesus said to them, you are wretched, you are miserable. Okay, he said, yeah, you are poor and blind. So what does God see when he looks at our congregation? And that's why we need to be humble. Okay, we need to be humble. We need to be humble and examine. Second Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourself, surely you, uh, you know that Jesus Christ is among you, okay? So, what's the conclusion? Don't ever be discouraged with smallness, with having no human help or material resources, or no human connection, I have no friend in high places, and so what? I have God. And if I have God, I have everything. Joseph didn't have nothing, but he had God, and yet he became the prime minister, okay? So, don't be discouraged, but be faithful in your calling, okay? What is success? Success is knowing the will of God and doing it. That's where contentment, satisfaction comes from, okay? So be faithful in whatever place or position he has placed. That's humility. And, and don't fret because he says, humble yourself in the sight of God, James 4.10, and he will exhort you. He will promote you in due time. So don't be discouraged, you know, uh, uh, and, and naturally, as human beings, we do sometimes, and God has encouraged some, uh, some prophets. For example, Isaiah 49, um, verse 4, God was encouraging uh, Isaiah, is that because Isaiah said, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing, and in vain, yes, yeah, surely, my just reward is with the Lord. And that's the key. 
you know, your reward is with God. Or Abaco 3.17, you know, when, you, when the fruit, there's no fig trees, uh, um, no f um, f uh, fruit on the fig tree, no grapes on the vines, though the holy crop might fail, or the flocks die in the fields. You know, yet we rejoice in the Lord. So whatever thing is, whatever a thing is, uh, whatever a thing is little or big, if you have Jesus Christ, as your foundation, God is in it. But if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, then you're in trouble. So as I round up, if you don't have Christ, now is the time for you to give your life to Christ. Because with Jesus, no matter who you are, I tell you, he's the friend in high places. So if, if I'm talking to you, if you'd like to give your life to Christ, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I come to you in, in the name of Jesus. I confess I have sinned against you. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I receive him into my life. I confess him as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me your child today. In Jesus' name. If you said that prayer, meaning with all your heart, you are a child of God, you need to uh, find a Bible believing church, read your Bible, and connect with God. You know, uh, and you will grow and keep on watching. Keep on watching. So God bless you. Um, for staying with me. I, I believe you are, you've been encouraged today and I pray that God's grace be upon you. I pray that God give his peace. I pray that God will lift up his corners upon you and be gracious unto you, fill you with his peace in your mind, you know, and in your body, in your homes, in the mighty name of Jesus. So thank you for watching and see you next time, same place. God bless you. watching Faith World TV. Faith World TV, changing the world with the Word of God.